All right, so the topic this evening is going to be living systems and electricity, and particularly how do they interrelate. So the reason I picked this topic up was because it was coming up multiple times in discussion, and it was also one of those things where having a physics background helps, because electricity as much as is known in physics, may not have always translated over into biology, just because of that's just the nature of the field. And so, since that had been, been my bailiwick for a while, I started taking, look, taking a look at it and seeing, okay, how do, you, how do you see the two systems together? How do they interact? How do they interrelate? How were we even able to you know, think of it in terms of medicinal properties, what do we need in order to think of it that way, so on and so forth. So, it's kind of a borderline between physics and biology, so that's why I picked this up. And, of course, uh, it can be a little bit of a windy road, so maybe the questions, you can keep the questions and I'll try to answer them at the end best as I can. So, because I don't want to start explaining something now and it will come later and so on and so forth. So anyway, so living systems and electricity, how do they interrelate? So let's, let's start with the basic and logical step that should follow after looking at these two together, which living systems have electricity very predominantly in them? You want us to answer that? Sure. Every one. There's, yeah, there's predominantly. Three. The humans, or yeah, any, anything with a nervous system. Every, all living beings may have it, but which ones have it predominantly? So here is where a bit of history helps, because where they were first identified was in the electric fish. Uh, it's a kind of a bloody picture, I'm sorry about that. Well, the electric eel, the torpedo fish, and the other ones, there are various other denizens of the deep ocean. They look pretty nightmarish. And all of them pack a big wallop, electrically speaking. And that was the origin of our explorations of electricity. The first kind of descriptions, like you have in Greek times, the descriptions where Socrates was said to have been stunning his students the way the torpedo fish stuns its victim with his knowledge, of course. So this, this is the kind of comparison that crops up now and again, but it really doesn't come into its own until we have people experimenting with it. So this was, this is say, uh, around the time of the French Revolution, Something is odd around that time frame. For some reason, within 15 to 20 years of the French Revolution is when all of the scientific discovery happens. And here is a scientist called Walsh, and he's there with a friend of his, and they're creating a conducting path, and in that jar, in that bowl, is a torpedo ray. So they did that, Faraday did that, anybody who was anybody at that time did that. So other than lightning, which Benjamin Franklin was dealing with. This was the one which actually led to, you know, systematic uh, understanding of what we call today as electric current. So, actually, what year was that? This what was year? 1770s, 80s. Yeah. It when was, you were just a kid. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I was in grade school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the 1789 was the French Revolution. So, just a few years before that was when all of this kicked off. So, of course, people are looking at this and thinking, okay, how in the world does this fish pack such a wall? How does it give us such a shock? And so, they start looking at its structure. And by looking at its structure, they notice this kind of stacking that exists, different sheaths of substance which is on either side next to its lung, next to the lungs of the torpedo. And they're looking at it and, and trying to understand how it actually works. And in the process, this structure came about. This is basically 
copper, zinc, and this is paper actually dipped in brine or salt water. So wet paper or wet cloth, both were used alternatively. And then they stacked that up. The more you stack up, the bigger the shock. This was the world's first battery, at least as far as modern science goes. And the folks who did this uh, are, you know, even till today, struggling to come to terms with it. It's almost 250 years later, but Michael Mayer in 2017, one of the researchers, is saying the electric organs in eels are incredibly sophisticated. They are far better at generating power than we are. So it's still not been understood. Just, just as a, as a note, how this actually happens. How do they do that at such a level? But they got the first approximation and they ran with it. So who were the people who did that? First one was actually Johann Wilhelm Ritter. Very interesting scientist. He was extremely productive in a bunch of different fields, discovered ultraviolet light, discovered the rechargeable battery, discovered the battery in the first place, and you have not heard of him. Because this guy took the limelight, Alessandro Volta. Volta ended up discovering it two years later, but he had the unique fortune of showing it to Emperor Napoleon. Oh. And ergo, the self-promotion took off, and so he's, his name is what you hear. Volta, voltaic pile, voltaic cell, number of volts, all of that, that's because of him, the Italian Alessandro Volta. But this, uh, the first paper ever published in this was this. Proof that a continuous galvanism accompanies the process of life in the animal kingdom. Very simple, straightforward title by Johann Ritter in 1798, two years before uh, Volta did any of that. So, what we are looking at is basically the study of electricity came directly out of animal electricity right from the get-go. As far as, you know, opening the floodgates to the study of electricity, it came directly from the home of living animals. It didn't come as much from the other things. So you have this process. Now we are going to pay particular attention to what it means to say accompany, because there in that word is everything that we are looking for. Life, electricity, accompany. He just puts them side by side. At this point, he doesn't tell us what's the relation of one to the other. So that's uh, Johann Ritter. And he was so, you know, dead set on understanding electricity, whereas other people would, you know, take those cells and put it on some outside object. He did it on himself. Him and uh, Alexander von Humboldt did 4,000 experiments with electricity, with those huge stacks, the voltaic piles, and sticking them in all sorts of places, completely, you know, uh, gung ho about just seeing what happens. So they saw how it affected the eyes, if you put it over here, how it affected the ear, they, they did whatever you can think of. So this was probably one of the reasons this gentleman died when he was 34. He didn't live past 34. Extremely productive, died in poverty. But, yep, he kicked off the whole uh, field. He's not known today for that. He's known today as the father of electrochemistry because of his contributions to cells and everything of that nature. But, yeah, he also spent considerable amount of time studying the biology. Anyway, moving on. So now, the next step is kicked off by Galvani, Luigi Galvani, and he did it with frog legs. And of course, that's why I put this up, because since then, millions of frogs have gone. So in a way, the relation to electricity, the study of it started off with quite a lot of 
okay, like in that sense. And what was observed was how the frog muzzles twitched based on what conditions it twitched and how it was related to the nerves and how it related to the conduction of the nerves and so on and so forth. That's when people were developing that whole, you know, dialogue of how it actually works. And these experiments were, again, very thorough and very extensive. But Galvani was also squashed by Volta. So once again, the biological origin of electrical currents was pushed to the side and Volta's ideas that, you know, it just comes out because you stack multiple uh, substances next to each other, that took off. In other words, the inorganic mindset was more predominant than the organic. So that's how for another I think more than half a century, even Galvani's ideas were pushed down. Until his nephew, Aldini, who was really, really interested to show that his uncle's researches were correct, he picked it up and he started running with that whole uh, team. So, what he did was something even more bizarre. He actually ended up animating corpses. 1803 or 1813, I forget which. But in the early years of the 1800s, it was absolutely unheard of for, of course, something that has already, somebody who's already passed away to move again. He did that in front of a huge audience and that meant people suddenly saw a corpse move the hand, move the eye. It was so literally so shocking, one person went home that night and passed away. It was such a bolt, they couldn't, they couldn't stomach it. And this led to cartoons and drawings like this spread like wildfire in the scientific society of the day, that it is indeed perhaps possible, perhaps was what they were thinking, that, you know, uh, electricity is probably a means, there's a lot of little writing over there, it is a big debate going on about what exactly is happening. But the basic theme is, you know, life and death and its relation to electricity. That's you see that every day. I'm glad you stress conferences. <laughs> yes. Reanimation of the <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> so once once this kind of experiment or whatever demonstration took off in front of the scientific literati of the day. It was coincidentally also at the time uh, there was an enormous volcano. I think uh, this was Krakatoa or something. It was in Indonesia. Yeah, yeah there was, there was a huge one, and there was the year without a summer. Right, it was completely uh, crude up here as far as weather was concerned. And in that atmosphere, you had uh, Lord Byron the poet and Mary Shelley all discussing this sort of experiment. And if you remember who Mary Shelley is, the Frankenstein. Yeah. So young This is this is her discussing, you know, many and long were the conversations between Lord Byron and Shelley, whom she married later, to which I was a devout but nearly silent listener. During one of these, various philosophical doctrines were discussed, and among others, the nature of the principle of life, and whether there was any probability of ever being discovered and communicated. Perhaps a corpse would be reanimated. Galvanism had given token of such things. Right there. Uh, perhaps the component parts of a creature might be manufactured, brought together, and due to vital warmth, so on and so forth. But then, what happens is she starts thinking about it 
and the discussion had such a deep impression on her that she is kind of dozed off and in a half dream she sees with shut eyes I saw the pale student of unhallowed arts kneeling beside the thing he had put together. I saw the hideous phantasm of a man stretched out and then on the working of some powerful engine show signs of life, stir with an uneasy half vital motion. So, Frankenstein's story came out of experiments with bioelectricity. Particularly reanimating or making the parts move. Had such a such a huge impact on the society, and of course, that's a modern Prometheus story, which has been the theme ever since then. We do something which we don't really know how it affects and how it works that kicks in. So we have that now. That in the century later is completely immersed in biology like you all described at the beginning. Like whenever we speak of anything, any cell, we always speak of electric potential. In a cell membrane, we say, okay, there's some chemical word between this and this, there is always a difference. And in a neuron, which is particularly more prone for electrical stimulation, you have the entire structure mimicking in a way the behavior of electricity because electricity distinguishes itself from other forces of nature by being linear and the one organism in our body which is very distinctly linear is a nervous system as fibers upon fibers upon fibers upon fibers and you see over here this is the you know the major portion that the Schwann cell myelin sheath all of this which um, is surrounding it and encasing it and this will come in where, to be very important later on as well and then in addition to that there are also between this neuron and the next neuron there are also other cells called glial cells and glial cells are once again those which uh, work between neurons so you have neurons through synapses going the one way and another neuron to neuron going through glial cells so you have this entirety of knowledge with regard to electricity that is seen in our body. Did you say glial with a G? G-L-I-A-L. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, glial cells. It originally comes from the word for glue. Mm. They thought mm. it glued the things together. Mm. So yeah, they're the brain. And the brain as well, yeah. So that's the modern situation. So we have the whole early experiences and researches, some of which were, you know, very disturbing to people. And then we have this picture currently that we are all very familiar with. But still, it doesn't really give us a feeling for what electricity is really doing in the body. So, for that, we need to be able to understand, uh, uh, you need a picture. Yeah, for that, we need to understand something called induction. This is straight from physics, and it's very critical to understand. And that is how you can create an electrical disturbance of some kind, some spark, and how you can propagate that across space, and how you get a response on the other end. So this whole process, electricity, generating a field and then that field being picked up and regenerating the electricity. This sequence is extremely critical. So there is this very simple video of 30 seconds which I hope runs properly. There is no audio to this one. And you'll see him do something. So that's a lighter. He has a lighter spark generation over there. He's got two simple copper wires on that end and two simple copper wires on this end and an LED stuck to it. Just watch what he's doing. He just presses that, takes it away, presses again, takes it away, presses again. With distance it becomes more and more difficult to see a spark. Let me play that again.
Uh, what are you saying that he's pressing? He's 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 so taken right? he's taken apart a cigarette lighter, uh -huh. oh. and he's cast yes, only the uh, yeah not the rolling one but the one where you have to get a yeah so the right. click. So it it gives a slight electrical spark as soon as you press it, and that is that right there. That is simply connected on two ends to just two poles. Two. That's your antenna. That right here is an antenna. So a sending antenna and a receiving antenna. So right here, a spark. A sp Sir, there is no circuit. It's open. Okay, it's open. There is no circuit yet. But there is a spark which kind of activates this conductor goes through space and activates this conductor which in turn ends up showing you that activation by the LEDs lighting up. So this is a very, 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 very simple setup to show what actually happens with electricity and how it is transferred to another material. Now, if you have radio waves, this is the origin of radio waves, the same thing, instead of, you know, having long linear situation, if you create a cavity, instead of uh, um, the current being of a very tiny voltage, if it is a heavy, heavy voltage, then you have changed, by changing those conditions, instead of a radio wave, you can get a microwave. Mm -hmm. So a microwave is nothing but this thing wrapped up. Mm -hmm. So instead of a line, it's wrapped up and the voltage is through very heavy. That's why you have the transformer sitting over there inside your microwave. It ramps up the voltage like crazy and then sends that through this metallic, copper metallic cavity. And that generates the waves instead of this generating the waves. So what happens now, this one should have audio. After placing the tin foil in the microwave, we set the microwave for 20 seconds and start it up. As you can see, the tin foil will immediately start arcing and emanating a blue glow. Why do you think this occurred? Because the tin foil is metal and conducts electricity, the metal immediately begins to have a current when the microwave starts. The electricity on the metal jumps over the spaces between the ripples on the surface caused by crumpling the foil into a ball. When the microwave is stopped, the current goes away, and the foil is back to normal. Anyway, so, simple aluminum foil, and that's what happens. Now, the, the more prickly something is, the more pointed end something has, the worse that behavior will get, the more it will catch play. Why? Because once again, remember, electricity has a linear quality. Whenever there is a pointedness, it shoots up. That's why we use lightning rod, it's a line. So the more the metals are pointed, the more the radiation can respond to it. The more it is linear, the more easily it will respond to it. So we have this going on in terms of uh, induction. This is what is called induction. So electricity in one place generates an effect which ends up inducing electricity in another place. But what's required for that induction is something metallic or something that can conduct. So if you have something that can conduct, then this works. Otherwise it doesn't work. That's why there are some things which are microwavable and some things which are not. Number two, you realize that the electricity generation is primary. The heat generation is secondary. So the electricity is what gets activated first. The currents kick in first. And if you have something in there that resists that current, like almost all materials do to some extent, then you have the heating process. So that's how the microwave heating even occurs. That's how it was even discovered. Somebody was fooling around with radio equipment and very strong, what was called clistron and other devices during the war years, because they were trying to figure out how to send signals way to the, you know, across the world. And at that point, somebody's chocolate melted in his pocket. And that's how they figured out, oh, 
microwaves do this. And hence we have all microwave ovens in our kitchens. But the oven doesn't heat, it electrifies. And the electrification goes on heat. So that's one level even further into like say electric stove. In an electric stove you have something sitting outside, you pass electric current through that, that heats up and then heats up whatever you have put on it. That's how your electric stove works. Here, the substance itself becomes the conductor and therefore the electricity that's induced into that ends up heating it. So anyway, the basic point is, if there is something conducting that's available, then the conduction happens. And when the conduction is resisted in any way, then heating happens. These are the two things. Now think about the totality of what we have seen and <laughs> what, <laughs> what would common sense dictate would happen when electricity is active somewhere and its effect is brought in touch with things inside us that can conduct. In his case, curly hair. <laughs> <laughs> so, over here you notice that our body being something that can conduct electricity is one of the most important aspects that, that we need to be aware of today because this common sense is not taught anywhere. So, I'll give you examples. Take a look at this. It's, um, FDA, our favorite FDA, and it's talking about radio frequency radiation and cell phones, right? Cell phones also use radio waves. As they push into the 5G realm, they are moving into the microwave realm. Okay, so that's that's what is happening. It's going from there to there. So what are they saying? They are saying non-ionizing radiation does not have enough energy to break chemical bonds or strip electrons from atoms. And scientific consensus shows that non-ionizing radiation is not a carcinogen or, uh, and at or below the radio frequency exposure limits by the FCC, the ionizing radiation has not been caused, shown to cause any harm to people. Look at the language. See what they are not looking at. Even here, this is the FCC, Federal Communications Commission. Can people be exposed to levels of radio frequency that could be harmful? And what do they talk about? They say far below the levels to produce significant heating and increased body temperature. Very clever. Very cleverly done. Because what they have done is they have bait and switched it. So they have changed the effect on the organism from looking at the conduction, which there is plenty. There is no need to create ions. We have ions all through our nervous system. It's ready made. We have it everywhere in all our cells. The ions are everywhere. You don't need that. You don't need to create ions. But they speak of ionizing and non-ionizing radiation, which is a big deal in the radiation world, in the radiation safety world. Completely pointless. And they've been doing this for the last, I don't even know how many decades. So you have this one, like I just told you, with the microwave heating the food up, the heating is a secondary effect. You need to use a lot of microwave in order to heat something. And you know, you know that you need that big box to heat a tiny little thing. And so you can imagine how high the primary effect is going to be in order to create a little bit of secondary effect, namely heating. And what do they focus on? They focus on the heater. So the entirety of Wi-Fi, radio, everything that we have been dealing with for 150 years almost now, all of that deals with bodily conductive processes. And bodily conductive processes taken to an extreme cause problems. So let me read to you from this is a recent book that came out where the lady declares we are electric and on page 224 of this one this is the description they are looking at cancer cells 
and they are looking at the electrical signature of cancer cells. And the guy says, the cancer cells had traded their strongly negative electrical identities, which is what usually happens. Across that cell membrane, there is neg negative 70 millivolt, usually always present. They have traded that for the permanently depolarized zero existence of a stem cell. So they have gone from an electrical condition that is normal to an electrical condition that actually belongs to stem cells. No wonder they are so virile in multiply. And then another interesting thing. That wasn't the only electrical artifact that grabbed the attention. They were doing something else too, something far more perplexing. These depolarized cancer cells were somehow spiking. What business did these cells have with action potentials? These cells come from gut or skin cells, not nerve cells. And yet, the aggressive cancer cells had somehow gained this ability to spike like a neuron during their transformation from healthy cells. So, basically what you are looking at is what happens when the body has to deal with, what happens in cases like this, when the body is, has to deal with extra conduction. That becomes a prime factor in generating cancerous cells because you are artificially pushing the ionization and things like that so that the polarization messes up, other things mess up, and something that was not cancerous tends to become cancerous. So this was also discussed in another book called Dirty Electricity, where they were looking at how many people live very close to big high tension wires and this and that and the other, and how it affects them and so on and so forth. So in all of that, you will see that we are missing, we are missing the study of this phenomenon because we don't have conduction. The field, the field to look at this doesn't exist. And of course, you still have secondary stuff that people find out. So you have this group like Physicians for Safe Technology, and they're looking at cardiac effects of radio frequency radiation, and then they're looking at sclerosis and heart disease. Apparently, one of the primary effects of Wi-Fi and radiation, or what I would call hyper electrification of the human body, one of the um, classic results is sclerosis. Mm. So the vasculature, which is very normally very supple, starts becoming hard. It, in some ways they say it starts becoming more like a neuron, it starts becoming inflexible. And that causes heart disease and of course you also have the electrification that disturbs the heart rhythmic function as well. So electrical uh, disturbance creates arrhythmia. And then you also have this, uh, this study if you, you know, take a picture and note it down, what they actually found was in the brain and the heart, they found tumors specifically in those parts of the nerves that have maximum conductivity, which is those sheets, the nerve sheets that we were looking at. And they were also called Schwann cells, if you remember from that previous diagram. So if you go back and back and back, they're called Schwannoma. It's a very rare type of cancer among all the different ones. But that shows up whenever you have the Wi-Fi stuff. It's specific to that. Why? Because Wi-Fi is, like we saw, works through conduction, and conduction, these myelin sheets work through conduction. So the myelin sheets get screwed up. And what happens when the myelin sheet gets screwed up? You have multiple sclerosis. You have all the neurodegenerative issues getting amped up one way or another. So by losing out on the conduction, we have lost out on the very branch of biology that can deal with this issue. And you kind of have to piece it together. And people look at heating effects pointlessly, people look at ionizing effects pointlessly, and where only final say is when somebody actually gets cancer. 
Then you say, oh, you know what? There's Wi-Fi over here, there's cancer over here, and somehow something is happening in the middle, we don't know what, and then you get this result. That's unfortunately the status of current day research on the effect of electricity on human beings. So that's the one side. So now we just kind of make a list of the properties. You have where did we find maximum electricity in the deep sea with no light? The, the deeper you go, the more is the probability of you getting those kind of animals that you know pack the electrical charge. And electricity predominantly in our body works in the nerves. Of course, it's spread everywhere. Nothing in the body is isolated in only one spot. But there is a predominance on the nerve side where there is um, conduction. Then also an interesting side note to that is nerves are the cells that regenerate the least. Nerve damage is one of the worst. So they do regenerate the least. Exposure leads to sclerosis. You know, direct exposure can lead to death, as we all know, electrocution. And one interesting thing, just looking at it in terms of our human activity, electricity hijacks the will. When you, by some chance, get a shock, either your hand freezes or it jerks in a way that you don't expect it. So your will is bypassed, your free will is bypassed and it becomes automated will. That was how it was possible for them to animate the corpse because there is no question of a free will in that case. It's direct activity, direct will. So what it does in hijacking the will is another side effect we may not even notice our willpower getting sapped away. As we live in a more electrified environment, just due to the induction of this nature, with all the sources of electricity and radiation pounding on us, we are constantly swimming in electricity inside. Our internals are constantly getting activated. And in that, because there is miniature, you know, activating, uh, Incidence is happening throughout our nervous system, it can lead to attention deficit, it can lead to, you know, not being able to pull yourself together and, and do things. These are the kind of things that when electricity predominates in your body, that's what happens. Now, is electricity the only pole? Is the nerve sense pole the only part of the body? Here, we come to some expanded view of what's there in the human organism, our entire science predominantly focuses on this side, on the electrical aspect. There are a few sections here and predominantly over there, and then it spreads throughout the body and all the cells. But all the cells have a nervous component. All the cells also have a circulation component, a rhythmic component. Because if you look at blood, blood also goes to every corner of our body and every cell circulates materials in and out through its semi-permeable membrane. So in miniature, whether you take at the cell level or you take in the human organism level, in both these levels you have an independent system of circulation. And then you have the metabolic system which is mainly that which has to do with digestion and movement directly where you exert your free will. So these two are kind of opposites. And many times in the history of science, this has been confused with that. The frog example is this being confused with that. Because in a frog that is not alive, they saw a twitching, they thought this is what controls this. But they forgot that the frog was not alive. In a living system, this, this and this all check and balance each other. They are all 
you know, independent. They are all distinct and they all check and balance each other. That's why, for instance, when something crosses the blood-brain barrier, you have a problem. Why? That's when this one overwhelms this one. When something happens that makes this overwhelm this, then you have arrhythmia. Then you have circulation issues. Then you have sclerosis. When something happens where this overwhelms this directly, then you have tremors, seizures, things like that, where the electrical system overrules the organic, biological, what do you call it, metabolic system. All of it is biology, but what is not usually observed is each one of these being independent down from the cell level all up to the higher level. And the second part which is not usually identified is how these two relate to each other. When, when you are looking at sensory activity, the more sensitive sensations that we kind of deal with, the more tired we get. On the other hand, when we do something over here, when we have our food, that's when we get energized later on. So, you have a polarity. A polarity between the metabolic system and the nervous system, which is not normally recognized in medicine. Because due to the uh, physics predominantly, it tends to be focused over here. They look at the circulation system purely in terms of the nervous system. They only look at it in terms of, okay, what signals is the brain sending? That's the primary kind of lens. You see everything through that lens. But this is a distinct lens, that's a distinct lens, that's a distinct lens. So let's look at some more of examples. So ancient Egypt, in the casket, second casket from the grave of Tutankhamen, you have these two poles clearly distinguished. One says, this is an Ouroboros, head is over there, tail is over there, so the serpent biting its tail, and in the images they have written, he who destroys the flow of time. And then on the lower one, he who causes the flow of time to come into being. And then actual life pulses between those two. So, when you are looking at the head system, the head and nerves and subsystem was felt to be close to death in the realm of permanence. It's also called GF in ancient Egyptian. And over here, the metabolic system was felt to be close to life and the realm of flowing time, which gives rise to time. It transforms with time. Neha. So between Jeff and Neha, you have the central circulation system. So this knowledge, once again, is something that we have kind of put on the back burner. We have not even looked at it. We have not looked at three independent systems in the body, which all cooperate with each other. Kind of like the three branches of government are supposed to do. <laughs> but what happened, just like it happened in the branches of government, one took priority. <laughs> the executive started going crazy and in our sciences, the nervous system has started going crazy. And as a result, people have forgotten that one is less on the life scale and one is more on the life scale. One provides the life, one pushes the life back. Excessive of one or the other is not good, obviously. You need both. You need a balance of both happening all the time in the body, but you need to be very clear of which part does electricity come into and which part does the digestive process come into. Which pole do they each work in? So the electricity aspect works predominantly in the nerve cell system. And that was one of the reasons why the study of electricity itself started with corpses. It is not a coincidence that that's where it started. They started looking at it at the death pole, not at the life pole. And that's how they were able to generate 
all of it. And that's why we have the whole electrical culture around us. It's permeated with that. So another aspect, interesting part of this is this tripartite nature is also the exact inverse of what's there in the plant. And if you notice in old herbal traditions and so on, it's very well known that if you want to rejuvenate your nerves, you take root vegetables. Eat carrots so your eyes go good, so on and so forth. That's just one of them. There's a whole retinue of suggestions that come from that. The rhythmic central portion, that's where the more leafy vegetables actually come and help. They are very good for your circulation. And the same principle is exhibited in both cases, the rhythm and the alternation. You have a rhythmic sequence of bones for your ribs and your vertebra. Nowhere else is it rhythmic. Once it goes past the vertebra, you don't have any more rhythm. And up, you don't have rhythm. But in the middle, you have a rhythm. It comes, it comes, it comes. So that principle is embedded in the entire body, whether you take the skeletal or you take the musculature or you take the nervous or you take anything else. So you have this kind of symmetry in the body. And the same thing which happens with uh, the way the bones are structured. In the limbs, the bone is in the very center and all the flesh is around it. In the head, the bone is outside. It is the house in which the brain resides. It's flipped. So the polarity that we are speaking of is not a simply a theoretical polarity. It is actually expressed in every aspect of our structure. Isn't it amazing that you have bone outside and things inside and here it's completely flipped. And that is the basis for some of this. So you also have, you know, when digestive issues and so on, this is the most nutritive. For us, for plants to take as substances, the fruits, flowers here, but fruits are the most nourishing, right? And that goes straight for our metabolism. So the fruits are the best for the metabolism. That's leaves are good for circulation. Roots are good for the nervous system. This principle kicks in. And this is quite well known even in conventional science, especially for the plants. I mean, for all, what an economic forum knows about it, right? They are talking about how to generate electricity from the roots of living plants. The integration of electrical signals originating in the root of vascular plants. So wherever the root system is involved, you have the electrical aspect kicking in. And they say it has been proposed that plants might integrate information through a brain-like structure located in the root apex. So the inverted plant to the human being, once again, is not mere theory, but it starts penetrating into science in a completely different direction. So once you know that the human organism has a polarity, then you can start kind of tabulating those polarities and compare. We already looked at what's electricity and what happens in the opposite pole, the more you come down. Living organisms with less electricity generally live out in the open air, in the light. The more warm-blooded it is, the more it goes in that direction of having less of electricity in its organism. That's why deep sea reptiles in the cold, heavy electricity, warm blooded as much as it goes that way, less. There is a gradation, everything has it, but there is a gradation. And in the middle, amphibians is where it switches, where it's between cold blood and warm blood. And finally, reptiles are cold, amphibians are in the middle, finally you come to mammals. And then of course, once you reach the birds, it's very, very hot. So, they are the least electrical. And then over here, the nerves are predominantly, you know, what carry the electricity. Life is predominantly in the blood and muscle, which is more where the, um, you know, the body actually works. And then you have the regeneration aspect. 
nerves regenerate minimum whereas the interstinal lining and the mucosa they heal extremely quickly my dad would tell me like <laughs> a funny uh, description which his surgery professors used to tell him that you can while doing a surgery it's okay even if you end up spitting <laughs> near the interstine but you cannot even breathe on the joints and the nerves so the distinction is so different in one case the life forces are so strong that they can handle it any disturbance they can handle it but the other pole it can't handle it and that's what you see in this polarity and exposure excessive exposure to electricity leads to sclerosis excessive exposure to life kind of leads to a feeling of being satiated like how you feel after you know spending time in a warm pool or how you feel when you're sunbathing and th that particular feeling of well-being and satiation that's what life gives and when it goes too much it leads to sleep you feel so comfortable that you go to sleep so of course like i said everything in excess it goes the other way normally life stimulates the will but if it goes overboard it becomes sleepiness and over here of course electricity you can be hyperactive but it can also hijack your will and make you lose focus and lose your attention so you have a polarity here you have a minus and a plus so what's happening in this case is when it comes to the theme of disturbing the will or the theme of making it so that you don't you're not able to fully um, activate yourself electricity and its brother magnetism come in and that is why the whole graphene oxide scenario played out as well in the last 3 years because graphene oxide is very high conductivity extremely high it it you know it competes with copper it competes with aluminum in its uh, conductive capacity because of the nature of the planar structure of graphite and what that does the bodily electricity finds a pathway and where there is electricity its brother magnetism kicks in that's why you have the thing sticking so when you're looking at covid and things like that you are looking at things which try to amp up this part of the balance and reduce the other part so therefore there was a the fear of infection so that you know the infection is this being overwhelmed by this the nerve system overwhelms the life system and therefore you have a cold that's why you call it a cold so you when you're looking at this polarity now you come to understand okay what we are seeing with respect to electricity is like a negative shadow of the life process so when we are looking at a footprint for instance the footprint isn't the person but the place where it goes down if you can only perceive that then you will think the footprints are what is causing the next footprint and next footprint this will look like a nervous conduction so you'll not always be able to see that side by side with the nerve process there is always a life process it's the opposite pole the two are not separated in the human organism you have the one side and the other side one presses down one is above just like you know when you're diving off you may jump up but you press down on the diving board in the exact same way you your body is always partly in the nervous area partly in the living area and the one is battling with the other when the nerve pole finally wins you pass away when the metabolic system is very strong like during birth that's when that happens that's the reason for kids to be so energetic their metabolic activity is through the roof and so on and so forth the metabolic system is very high so you have the two poles you have the birth pole and the death pole the warm and the cold and the same thing is joined together while we are living 
in different ratios. So from this you can see that being immersed in an ocean of electricity does tend to make us older faster. We get more wrinkles faster, all of these aging processes start getting kicked in. And what did we notice during COVID? Most of the diseases that come during a later age start coming at a young age. So you can see how the electric pole has overreached into the human organism and resulted in those disturbances. So Ritter saw this. So the, remember Ritter whom I mentioned next to Volta right in the beginning. Volta took the direction of electricity only and went that way. But from the very same processes, even though Ritter was the first one to even create the battery and create rechargeable batteries on which our entire civilization runs, even though he was the one who did that, what he saw was the opposite pole. He saw the life pole and said, we now have hope for the solution of many a problem of that, 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 that. Even the farmer has new advantages. In all of nature, the principle is to be found from which from now on you will allow me to call the principle of life. So the whole reorientation which is required is for us to be able to look at electricity and life processes as polarities. One affects the other, but they are in a delicate balance which we, be, we have to be very aware of. And in our current day, we are heavily in the direction of the nerve sense pole. We are heavily in the direction of electricity. We have very little on the other side of the balance. That's the reason why we, you know, struggle so much. So this was also mentioned in 1924 uh, by Rudolf Steiner, who was giving the agricultural course. We're telling people about the agriculture. What happens? You know, what do you need to do in order to stimulate a better growth in plants and so on? And then the question was asked, okay, what will happen if an animal eats food that has been preserved through electrification of some sort? It could be refrigeration, it could be something else. But there was a generic question asked. Answer was, electricity in the form of radiations is no more a remedy than pricking with small thin needles can be a remedy. So, it is not the electricity which heals, but the shock it produces. So, in acupuncture, and in electrical remedies, what is actually happening is you are creating a disturbance on one end of the pole and the body is supplying the other end of the pole to compensate. You are not directly giving it the life force it needs. What you are giving it, you are pushing it this way and it rebalances and in that rebalancing process it is pulling in some extra resources. And that is what's happening, both in case of acupuncture in some way, which is a lot less invasive, and in case of electrotherapies, which kind of went to an extreme with shock convulsions and so on. So that was the main thing. It must not be forgotten, however, that electricity has a particularly powerful effect on the higher organization in living beings, upon the head in man and animals, upon the root in plants. An animal that eats food that has been preserved to electrification will therefore gradually tend to grow sclerotic. So the same thing that happens in us happens in that. Electricity is the last thing in the world which ought to be introduced into a living being to promote its life. Because that's not exactly what it does. It's in the opposite direction. It cannot promote life. Electricity at one level lower than life. The higher the level reached by the life, the more it tends to rid itself of electricity. That's what we saw with the deep sea fish and the reptiles leading later on up to the several higher organisms where that is removed and it goes to the warm pole. And if you induce the living organism to take repulsive measures when there is nothing to be repelled, the organism becomes nervous and fidgety and gradually sclerotic. So you lose balance which is one of the primary issues of the day. So this is basically the fork in the road that we come to when uh, looking at the human organism. There is a reason why electrical conduction has been completely kept in the background and I think the reason is they do not want us to realize, number one, how it works and how it affects us, number two, how it disturbs our will process. Because if the whole, you know, controversy about the things that was possibly in the shots and what could have become a circuit of some kind and things like that, all of those discussions, people are probably sensing that the more they allow of the nerve sense pole to enter into them, the more hijackable they will be. 
and the technologies, Neuralink, this, that, all of that go in that direction. They, they focus on the nerves and spore. But, yeah, I mean, that's also the reason why we have that statement by Morpheus in the Matrix. Wants, the machines want to convert the human being into that. And so the ideas that lady, we are electric, that book, you can see it comes supported by the military, supported by pretty much the who's who of whom we have all been fighting over the last three years. And that is heavily pushed into the literature, into the discussions, into the practices, both mainstream and alternative. But on the other hand, what is being crushed right now? Homeopathic remedies. Because homeopathy provides, through the dilution of substance, a method for it to be taken up by the metabolic system very well. And that is the reason why that is being crushed. They don't want to hear about homeopathy. They don't want to hear about dilutions. They don't want to hear about the rhythms of the dilution and all of that that comes along with it. So in, in a very real sense, electrotherapy and homeopathy are exact polar opposites. Homeopathy tends to actually stimulate the life process. And of course, different dilutions affect different parts of the body. Some affect the metabolic primarily, some affect the rhythmic, some affect the nerves, what have you. But you can access through the life force, you can access the human organism. Through this force, you access from the top, you access the death pool actually. So it requires that caution. It was born more or less, the study was born in that and it has continued in that and it has been part of our experience also in the last few years and it also kind of decides how we will go in our medicines, in our you know, uh, understanding of medical knowledge and in also being able to adequately deal with the 5G issue, there is no way you can do that without, you know, getting the other half of the coin like this. So anyway, that's the end of my presentation. That's what I wanted to share with you guys. Okay, the, the Ritter guy, 1798. Yeah. That's about when Hahnemann was like, stumbling onto the yes. homeopathy. Same time. Same time. Two the poles. The of creation of what had to come out. Yeah. The racket was yeah. There. Exactly. Same thing. Yeah. yeah. Very I'm true. Glad you, uh, I'm glad you tied that to what's going on today because almost everything that you talked about up there has a parallel to the jab. Yeah. Everything. Everything. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Including polarity. Yeah. Which I, I do have the remedies of Magnetus Polyambo mm -hmm. to address the magnetism that we're seeing that I'm checking for. In people's bodies. Yeah. And interestingly enough, did you know that the CDC had a zombie apocalypse warning on their website? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you didn't, I just Googled really? it and checked it. Really? Is it still up there? <laughs> no. Really? So here's yeah. serious. So here's here's what I just I just pulled off my copy that says Preparedness 101, Zombie Apocalypse to the Public Health Matters blog in 2011. The post was an example of